on demand, unhindered playback service. Watch all the webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system proposes podcasts, an online version of the famous Not the Home Magazine, virtual training model, where there's a technique course, a discussion board, and much, much more. We hope to join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online and educating and educating together. Right. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gents, to all of you who are joining us on this broadcast, and a very good morning to you all in the room. Uh, I'm Bikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, in Cambridge, UK, and also the president-elect uh, of SICOT. And it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and an honor to host you for this interesting event. This is the first time we are actually hosting this webinar, which is a hybrid event. Uh, that is you being live there and also being broadcasted all around the world. And I'm extremely thankful to Rafa and to Nico for actually making this happen. Not sure whether you can hear me. Hey. Good morning, everyone. It's a true honor to us to have in the, in the next hour this SICOT symposium within the program of our 20th uh, meeting, uh, Latin American meeting of hip and knee surgeon. We are excited to have such a distinguished group of professionals gathered here today to share insights, knowledge, and innovation in the field of total hip replacement in adolescents and young patients. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward in the next hour to a fruitful discussion and collaboration. Thank you. Um, first speaker. In the, in, in the next minute, uh, we are gonna share with you a uh, short video promoting video of our meeting, <clears throat> please, video. Hmm? Thank you, big, biggest. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vicas and Dr. Rafael. Now get the stars of presentations related to replace arthroplasty in the young patients. Our first speaker is Dr. Mikel Pons with the tribology. What will be the best for a young patients? Okay, good morning everybody. It's a big pleasure to be here with all around the world. Well, I will try to show you, which is my idea about the tribology in young patients. Uh, these are my disclosure. And for me, this is the best uh, bearing couple for very young people. And I try to show you the reasons for my decision. Well, the history of ceramic on ceramic was born in Europe. And I was born as an orthopedic surgeon with this prosthesis, the Mittelmeier prosthesis with this uh, cap, or, uh, a ceramic cap, with some very good results uh, with a long follow-up. 
Unfortunately, the first uh, devices had many, many problems, but they, they failed because the design, not for the ceramic. But up to now, we have some very long up patients. But the question is, what to do in youngers? Well, uh, when I began to work in my hospital in San Rafael, I found many, many young patients because on the origin, it was a children, a child hospital. And I had to do some replacing in very young patients. At that time, I used ceramic on poly. And as you can see in these slides, in a few years, there was an important work that required the replacement of these caps. No? Another example with the same wear and osteolysis along the screws, and even with modern devices with this wear. So it's true that in our literature, there are many, many reports about the long survivorship of these uh, liners with a slightly cross link polyethylene uh, with a follow up up to 15 years. But the question is what will happen at 20 or 25 or 30 years? Because these patients are very, very young. So in 2005, I began to use uh, the new devices with Delta Ceramic. Uh, because with the old devices, there were cases of a strip wear, especially in, in cases with micro separation between the cap and the insert, as you can see in this video. But with the modern uh, ceramics with zirconia, the delta, uh, as you can see, the wear in situations of micro separation is uh, like a normal situation. So I think this is the big advantage of these uh, ceramic or ceramic devices. No? Some papers I would like to show, this one about burning surfaces, and we know that the, the cross-link liners and health they have good uh, behavior with the, the, the wear, but they have poor oxidation resistance. On the other side, the remelted uh, crosslink uh, polyethylene uh, has less fatigue resistance. So the crosslink process, we know that increases the wear properties, but maybe uh, they um, are uh, to be at more risk of uh, fracture. So we don't know what will happen at 20, 25, or 30 years with these liners, no? Another uh, study uh, that shows that really these uh, modern devices has less risk of fracture, but there is some situations that we have, we have to take in care in order to avoid some complications. The last one I show you is that this uh, ceramic on ceramic uh, wears uh, wearings decrease the wear, uh, but uh, still now there are some concerns about these uh, ceramics, especially the fracture and the squeaking of the of the hip. Some cases treated during the, these years with uh, these devices, a young boy with these displacers, uh, with these both hips and ceramic on ceramic, he's still playing football. I don't recommend this, but he's still playing football with his friends. Another very young patient after some surgeries in another a hospital because of Pertis disease. Finally, we decided a total hip arthroplasty. He is still climbing. I don't recommend it, but he does. And this is the, another case with a young lady uh, after uh, an osteotomy, a paracetamol osteotomy, and she is still dancing. Uh, but what about the concerts? Uh, we know that there are two main concerts with these devices. The first one is the noises. There are in literature many num nouns about these noises. And of course, the insert of the head or the insert. Well, let me to show you one case about the noises. This is a young woman with, after this barrier femoral osteotomia in the years, I replaced the left uh, hip and she reported me some squeaking in his hip. After a few months, I replaced the other hip and the squeaking of the left hip disappeared. The reason, I don't know, because we don't know the real um, etiology of this analysis. No? What about the fracture? I haven't had any fracture during my last 20 years until last year. This was my first fracture of the insert. When the patient arrived, we reviewed the previous uh, X-rays 
and we saw that probably the insert was not very well positioned, and maybe this was the cause of the fracture. During the surgery, we removed all the big fractures, and we replaced the insert for another ceramic insert. Unfortunately, problems never arrive alone, and only a few months later, I received another patient, similar patient, with this fracture, and when we review, we saw that the surgeon didn't position very well the insert. So in both cases, the problem was the same, a technical mistake made by the surgeon. During the surgery, you can see the fracture, and we replace again with another insert of ceramic. If you use ceramic and ceramic and you have a fracture, it's very, very important. You must know that you must use another ceramic or ceramic or ceramic on poly. Never, never, never metallic metal on poly. Remember that, please. Uh, finally, I want to show you that this idea is not new. There are some reports with a uh, long follow-up with very young patients with these ceramic on ceramic devices. So take home message for me is that ceramic on ceramic has the lower wear rate up to now. We had very good results after 20 years and literature uh, shows the same results. But remember that this is a very demanding and precise technique. A bad technique is very, very dangerous because the main problem will be the fracture of the insert or the fracture of the head. It's very, very important, the patient selection. If very big patient with a high body mass, uh, uh, with a very high uh, weight or with a very active activities, maybe it's better uh, ceramic on poly. And for me, up to now, this is the best for young patients. The future, I think that maybe for young patients, this will be the future, no? There are some trials up to now, in, especially in England and Australia, with these devices. Uh, and as they ask, maybe this is the new gold standard for very young patients. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mikel. Now it's the turn, Dr. Erwin Cap. Total hip arthroplasty in juvenile arthritis. Thank you. Good morning. It's a wonderful stay here. Okay, sorry. Again, good morning. It's a wonderful stay here. Thank you, Rafa, Dr. Vicas. Thank you, Nicolas, uh, by this great opportunity. First time speaking English. It's uh, very good for me. I am Dr. Erwin Kapp. I come from Mexico, Media Yucatan, a great place, an Asian culture. This is uh, my introduction. Um, I don't have any kind of uh, interest conflict. Okay. I want to begin this speech with that uh, article. It's very interesting, the, all, all the speak there, because uh, the AR, uh, rheumatic arthritis, it's a very common and a frequently disease. In this, in that moment, um, was a register from 1995 and 2010. Uh, you can see all um, percentage of increase in that severis um, uh, disease. This is a form or the the CD4 cells introducing into the uh, wall of the principal cells um, and cause of the, the destruction uh, between the between each other, CD8 cells and CD4 cells. 
in this graphic, you can see the principal causes of the uh, hospitalizations in that kind of patients. Uh, this informant is from ORC. It's very interesting because we don't understand uh, all the principal uh, reasons for the these attentions. This graphic shows you the hospitalization that includes arthritis and other rheumatic condition. In this time, I want to uh, talk to you about the uh, ankylosing spondylitis. It's a very interesting uh, disease, and all all is a, a big difficult to work with uh, these patients. Distribution for hospitalization for arthritis and other rheumatic conditions. Okay, you can see all the percentage and uh, distribution for uh, con conditions. And among adult, adults and between 18 and older. It's, it's a, a problem, the differentiation between uh, AR in young patients uh, for the age groups because uh, the child is in another condition. Since 2022, the ACAS and the American College of Rheumatology, uh, we recommended these kind of, of measures from the treatments and the best moment in the, that patients uh, will be uh, operated. In 2023, the same thing, the ACAS and the uh, Rheumatological College from USA emit that uh, kinds of recommendations. The optical timing, this is very difficult because if you see an, uh, one patient with an AR with mobile uh, joint, or if you see a young patient with no mobile joint. Okay. This work is very interesting. Why? Because the primary total hip arthroplasty in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. It's a very different condition from AR. It's a totally condition in the aspects for your diagnosis on these patients. You can, see, you can observe the incidence, it's increased in that kind of patients. In, in that moment of the time. Okay. Uh, in this hospital, I worked um, 11 years ago. Uh, it's very difficult for us to obtain all the resources for that kind of patients because uh, the people not uh, gives uh, enough uh, resources for for this kind of surgery. We depend in that hospital for the government help and the uh, patients in, uh, themselves. Okay. All the patients in this work confirm the diagnosis with antigen HLA B27. This is a fundamental uh, blood test for the diagnosis, the clinical aspects and the blood test with this kind of antigen. In the autoimmune rheumatic disease, is, uh, this antigen uh, had uh, two arms, uh, leg, uh, long arm and short arm. The principle for the diagnosis is the short arm. With short arm, you determine the precisely diagnosis from uh, spondylitis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Case one, male, 20 years old, diagnosis, uh, spondylitis, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, hip mobile, incipient, uh, incipient phase. It's the principle at the start. Uh, you look all the changes in and the quality of bone. It's like a ancient 
uh, people, but these patients has 19 years old. It's very interesting, all the changes around the hip. That uh, was the solution with a total hip replacement. Uh, we work with a uh, uncemented less uh, stem and uh, hip cups. Uh, was in, in press fit because the quality of the acetabulum uh, stock was good. Case two, male, 27 years old, left feet mobile. You can see all the space, it's very short. The quality of bone. In this case, we use a cup with screws and on cemented on cementless stem. Male, 21 years old, both hips. This is an extreme case. Uh, total fusion, patient no mobile, um, both hips. First was the right side. And second time, the left side, um, a difference, um, eight, nine years. Male, 20 years old, left incipient, hip mobile. Mobile, it refers to a uh, range of motions, a little range of motions, uh, on the thing and flexion. This is resolution, the same thing with a fixation of the cup with the screws. That was my team in that time. And to take home, please read uh, this article. It's very interesting with all the changes for the uh, adequate um, many forms to uh, work with these kinds of patients. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Erwin. Good presentation. Now, please, Dr. Sacha Bittelman. Total hip arthroplasty in hemophilic patients. Thank you very much for all the people from the CICOT to give me this invitation to talk about the very and rear a uh, disease to have a, a total hip and total knee replacement. And I expand a little bit my talk in knee because it's a very, very more common uh, than a hip in hemophilic. And why young people? Uh, we're not talking about uh, adolescents. We're talking about people around 20 to 30 years because this disease need a longer time to produce a, a problem. Um, before because we're doing a lot of very elderly people with a very good results and we're uh, introducing more and more uh, elderly people, we started to find these results are very good. And this is a reason because we started to do this with a very uh, special kind of patient. The demography changed a long time ago. Uh, on my fair experience, uh, less than 20 to 30% of or surgeries where people less than 65 years old. Now it's, it's almost half and a half. Um, maybe 40% of my patients uh, got less than 40 years. And this patient need or ask to have a, a very good results and very quick. They need to work, they need to play sports, and they need to have these surgeries to be done now. And this is the, the first question they asked to you. Uh, I got a lot of pain, I can walk, and I need uh, no pain anymore, and I need to play all my sports, and I need to carry on doing my job with a, a normal hip or a normal knee. This is the main problem we got with young patients. Uh, uh, the life expectation is uh, higher than the, the, the patient with 65, and they walk more they do more things and the wear of these joints is going to be uh, uh, quickly. Was 
uh, the changing of demography is because there's too many pathologists who 30 years ago, we didn't take care about to as an uh, election for a uh, total hip or total knee replacement. And we're introducing now uh, uh, this in our uh, 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 clinics. This is a pathology. Uh, the joints more involved are knees far away and ankle, elbows, and hips. Very rare other one. Um, what happened with the, with the uh, pathology? There is a chronic hemophilic atropathy who involved this a bleeding a recurrent um, synovial who is uh, very bad and this is going to destroy the cartilage. What happened, why we do the indication for total hips or total knee and no other kind of uh, uh, treatment is because we got advanced uh, degenerative changes, the pain occurs, but deformities and always they started to have uh, stiffness. To have a good results, you are, are good surgeons, but that is not enough. We are only a, a change in this uh, part of the treatment. You must work with a very a specific hemophilic treatment center. Um, hematologists, nurses, uh, physiotherapists, and a lot of people. You are only one more of this team. They are going to do all these things for you. Uh, you can study this. Somebody is going to ask you about these things, but you not you don't need to be an expert uh, because there is somebody else who is going to work with you about what uh, is going to be able to put this patient in theater. Some question we always ask: What happened with the prophylaxis on the vein thrombosis in these patients? Uh, good question. I don't have the answer. We didn't use it in anyone, and we don't find any uh, uh, DVT in our patients. What we need to do, uh, we try to do at least two procedures in the same surgery because it's so expensive to bring one of these patients in theater uh, with all the things we need to introduce uh, in the treatment to control the hemophilia. Uh, risks are high, uh, it's more frequent to have infections, uh, and you need to consider this uh, especially in the patient who uh, got HIV positive. Um, bleeding acute in this patient, very, very unreal. I didn't see anyone. And if you got something like this clinically, you must uh, check what is happening. And normally what is going on is uh, the patient got an infection, uh, an hematoma, or who is going to be infected, and you need to treat it like that. Our experience is 37 patients. Uh, this way, I say to you, we work for a group, for a center on hemophilic, and this is changing for several places in, in my country. At that time, we did 65 surgeries, only eight hips and 48 knees. Uh, always, we try to do a couple of the, this in the same patient. Um, all the patients are under 35 years old, and I think the younger was uh, 17 or 18, no more than that. Few uh, patients like this one was very, very quick, the degenerative changes, but this is a very straightforward uh, procedure. Uh, when it's in theater, the patient is compensated for the hemophilia. You forgot this patient got an hemophilia, and we, we enter to the surgery. There's a lot of fibrosis and synovia you need to remove, but the procedure is, uh, is uh, like a normal one. This is a very unlucky patient who got a dysplasia and hemophilia at the same time. Um, but again, was no any, any difference to do a total hip in the left side and a total knee in the opposite side of the same surgery. This is a kind of stiffness we got. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of this same patient, uh, preoperatively and postoperative. But you can see we can uh, straight the knee, we can flex it at all, and he got some problem on the opposite hip as well. This is a kind of surgery you use a knife just for the skin. All the surgery is done by hammer and a chisel. And this is a result. You can see doesn't look very good. Uh, you can question about the, the alignment and everything, but the patient is so happy. This is a knee we got normally, a stiff knee. 
this is what is looking inside, very bad synovia. You can see there is no collateral ligament, no collateral ligament in the other side. You end, of course, with a very constrained prosthesis. And this is the result. You can see the patient can flex a lot. And this is an x-ray uh, follow-up. Another one, few patients who got fractured as well. You can see these are young men normally. They, they like to do a sport and everything. And they got fractured as well. And we try to do primary prosthesis always, but several times we need to use this uh, a more constraint. Always the synovia is there. We produce a lot of problem, but if behind the, the synovia, your ligaments are intact, we try to do a primary prosthesis. This is a patient from the beginning I showed to you. He was a agriculture a worker, still doing his job with that. And this is a result after three months with two knees. And you can see how is uh, the gait because need to be done the, the, the total hip on the left side. I don't recommend this. We tried to do sequential in the same act, but we did with two teams at the same time. Our scrap nurse was crazy because we were asking for the motor and, and the drill and this and this other. I don't think this is a good idea, but we did several times. Our results were three patients who were infected, only two were deep, and we must do a revision for those. Only one non-infected hematoma, uh, five patients get uh, an atrofibrosis, never had a fracture and never has a loosening so far. Satisfaction, these patients are very satisfied. Doesn't matter how much they move, but they are very, very happy. Complex surgeries, yes, sir. Complex patient, I can tell you that. And all the, the people who are around, the people, uh, the, the patients who got hemophilia are complex. Um, it's very expensive to bring a patient to a, a theater. And this is a reason because we do at least two procedures. The orthopedic cost is the less one. A higher percentage of infection, but not that bad. Uh, but they would think they got excellent results and the patient are very happy. And for this, you got only one message. You must work with a team who can manage this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sacha. Now, please welcome Dr. Nicolás Restrepo, total hip arthroplasty in the high hip dislocation. Thank you, Sule. It's a pleasure to be here in Cartagena and to chair this uh, conjoint meeting with CICOT. Uh, we're going to talk about total hip arthroplasty in high dysplasia. We don't have any conflict of interest. Uh, and it's a difficult topic because it's a big challenge in adolescents to decide if we prefer to do Plasty. Uh, and in some cases, probably in all, most of the countries in the world, uh, this decision is not by us, but the orthopedic surgeons should prefer to do the surgery and, and a hip uh, open reductions. What happens with this open reduction on osteotomy? Uh, they think that it's a good main to prepare the hip for a total hip arthroplasty to correct the length discrepancy, avoiding complications like sciatic neuropraxia and have to do osteotomies to put our, our hip arthroplasty. But sometimes it would be difficult. It's difficult to perform. It's difficult in, even to maintain a proper reduction. So we have to put some wires occasionally. And even uh, we have to do in two stages. So... That's the rapid progression to osteoarthritis problems. 
and the possible this future disadvantage will be to deal with these scars and we deal with the fibrous tissue around our hip. Uh, it will be difficult uh, and even if it's bad for use and don't have a successful uh, surgery, deal with a new dislocation plus the step previous surgery. Uh, that makes difficult to perform a total hypertroplasty. The hardware removal probably uh, have to uh, deal with another uh, type of by, uh, stems that do you, you don't use it, like uh, short stems. And in femoral deformities, if you perform a virus osteotomy to reduce these hips, it will be difficult to set a, a proper total hip arthroplasty. What the literature say, there's not uh, much to, to talk about this, but in this paper with prayer pelvic osteotomy, uh, affect the optum for sure. Uh, he compared the outcomes uh, with and without osteotomy. And uh, we need more supplemental screws, more autologous bone grafting. It's a longer mean operative time with more bleeding and more reoperations. What about total hypertroplasty in the adolescence? We have to deal with this kind of problems. Uh, bone is immature. Uh, even the growing feces, the bone and the joint uh, are growing up. Uh, and we have to ask how soon we did, uh, we performed this total hypertroplasty, which osteotomy, which type of implant. Uh, all my precedent speakers talk about this. And this paper talk about uh, people with total hypertroplasty in patients before 20 years, old and younger. The historically bad, bad results uh, we tried 91 primary total hypertroplasty in 78 patients, less than 20 years. Mm, in 1980 to 2016, average 17 years, with an average follow-up of eight years with the high hip score of 92, and a survivorship uh, and reparation at 10 years, 95%, and revisions for any case, 97.2%. And this paper is a systematic literature review talking about uh, that is generally avoided, but now show improved functional outcomes with lower vision rates. Uh, after 98, the, the line, the cut line, uh, what's difficult and more revisions problems with the prosthesis, with the liner loosens as uh, Michael Togos. Uh, right now, with uh, the cross-link poly and the ceramic on ceramic, probably there's uh, problems are avoiding. So finally, we can have three scenarios dealing uh, a, a patient, an adolescent and a young patient, three scenarios with these displaces. The first one and the easy one is a well reduced hip. The, the osteoarthritis is progressive and we need to do a replacement. Like in these cases, uh, for sure, the, the destruction will progress even rapidly, and we have to perform uh, a total hip arthroplasty. The never treated that came to us to decide if we, did, uh, if we perform a total hip arthroplasty, and the bad produced with hardware, probably the worst of the scenarios. What happened with the first scenario? In a well reduced that the arthritis, the arthritis is progressive. It's, it's the easy one. You have to perform as a simple primary, uh, deciding probably the cup according to the morphology, the size, the walls. I'm according to Dr. Michael Pons to try to do ceramic on ceramic in special patients, setting well the, the ceramic or uh, ceramic on poly uh, about the tribology. We have to deal with short and uh, narrow stems. Uh, in this case, you have to be prepared to use uh, short stems or stems, uh, conical stems like this one. I put a pencil to see the, the narrow of these uh, tiny uh, stems. And in a well-reduced arthritis, you can choose uh, the stem that you want according to the 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 configurations of the stem according to door. In the never treated, you have to take in account anatomical deformities, 
I always talk that the posterior wall it have probably a good posterior wall and a bad anterior wall. So we need to reset probably a little bit of the posterior wall to get better coverage of our cups. It's different if it's crowd two, three or four, for sure. It's different and we need to decide how to deal with the acetabulum. In this case, for example, it's a crowd two. Uh, you have to reset more in post par posterior part to have a, a good des a descent of the cup. This crowd three, for example, uh, it's uh, easy to use the the border between the find the the original and the false acetabulum to get more fixation in this part. And in this crowd four, probably it will be difficult. Probably you need to descend it and descend to the original side, but always my recommendation is not to use a high hip center. It's better to use and localize the original part of the acetabulum to, to get a good fixation for a, a long time. Like this case, like this case, don't matter what do you prefer to use yeah, as a stem. And in the never treated a uh, patient is difficult to descend. You have to uh, be careful with the descent. And for example, in this case, you uh, for sure cannot descend even doing big traction. So that's the time to do an osteotomy uh, and don't hesitate to do an osteotomy, whatever you like, if you prefer according to the doors uh, type of the femur, subtrochanteric uh, uh, power lining tap or, or distal uh, it's, it's better if you can descend more than 1.5 or 2 centimeters to do an osteotomy. The worst case scenario, the bad reduced hardware, it's important to re remove it first. I apply the rule of 45 minutes uh, and my destruction capacity of this, uh, this, this hip. In this case, if you need more than 45 minutes to descend it, probably it's better to do it in two stage uh, and wait more than three months to uh, begin the other uh, procedure and put the, the, the place. In this case, for example, we need a board to remove all the plate and we have this big hole and we have to deal with the remain the deformity and we have to plan to descend with or without osteotomy. Uh, usually, probably we need to descend without osteotomy. Like these cases, uh, you need to remove the hardware uh, in the right one, right hip. We can use it two times, what's difficult, and use a distal supracondylar osteotomy. And in the uh, left one, we remove it in one time easily and use the bending part of the femur to do an osteotomy, a supracanteric osteotomy, to descend and put the hips in place. The take home messages. DDH is still common in our countries. It's always difficult to treat it. The later open reduction and osteotomy can work, but if you have a bad treatment, could be the worst case a scenario. We have three scenarios with different approaches and you have to select implants according to the plan. Nowadays, in total hip arthroplasty, we have for sure better outcomes and it's quite similar to the adults. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctors, for this excellent presentation. So please welcome to the podium. Please, Dr. Sacha. Now it's time to discussion and question, please. A question can be online too. So where we will other question, I have some some question uh, to Dr. Mikel. Doctor, uh, we know uh, the difficult to uh, placement uh, insert acetabular. So do you have some tricks for placing the insert and the femoral head? Well, it's the most important part of the surgery, I think, the 
when you have to insert the insert, no? So what I always recommend is to be very careful. You must be able to see all the the rim of the cap. And when you insert the, the ceramic, there are some devices, but I prefer to do it with my fingers, to be very, very careful, to be very, very slow, to do very slowly. And what I am sure that it is really well positioned, this is the time to impact uh, only with one, uh, with the hammer, only once. So I, I think that this is very important, to see perfectly all the rim. Another point that I think it's interesting, but for when you use a femoral, uh, f ceramic femoral heads, is uh, to clean very, very well the trillion of the, of the, of the stem. Because if there is no very well clean, it's another risk factor for fracture of the head. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Dr. Sacha, please. Um, Respect to uh, this patient with uh, hemophilic, uh, in the post-operatory immediate, do you have a change respect to uh, rehabilitation? Uh, do you have immediately or uh, do you... Uh, uh, the post-op uh, for this kind of patient is exactly the same like a primary for any other condition. Like I say, uh, the people who deal with the disease is going to tell you, use this uh, medication, don't use this anti-inflammatory, but uh, all the rest is exactly the same like a primary. Uh, we're doing two and sometimes three surgeries at the same time. But these are young patients with not bad muscles, and we go straight forward for the rehabilitation. Well, Dr. Erwin? Um, respect to patients with uh, juvenile arthritis, uh, we know the difficult on the evolution of these patients. In this respect, um, do you um, prefer to, uh, in this patient collocation of the COP double mobility or COP uh, primary? Uh, in that time, we don't have uh, a great system like uh, it's a uh, dual mobility. Um, in that moment, the, we use the um, femoral head size uh, 32. Uh, and the problem with that kind of patients is all the muscles very weak. And in that moment, uh, the evaluation all the subjects uh, was from the good results for the um, uh, obtain a well ranks of motions. Thank you, Doc. Anyone question? Please, Doctor. Eh, buenos días. Primero, quiero disculparme por mi mal inglés. Así es que I apologize for my English, so I'm going to ask in Spanish. Miguel, you talk about very young patients. Is there a consensus on the age? Because Sasha made my day happy when he mentioned young patients of less than 65 years of age. Very happy. So at what age do you consider a young patient? Let me, let me, let me talk like the question is, uh, what is the age that the... Um, uh, Dr. Pons consider for using a ceramic or ceramic. Is that the okay. question? Yeah. In my opinion, I use ceramic or ceramic uh, for patients younger than 50, 55 years. I think that after 55 years, uh, the, the literature show that the follow-up of the patient with uh, cross-ring polyethylene with ceramic is so long that we don't need in this patient ceramic or ceramic. So, my age is about 50, 55 years old. ¿Y alguna razón en especial para esa edad? Por la gran movilidad. Any reason for that age? Because of their uh, big, good mobility. I don't know if your country, but there's very difficulty. There's a lot of difficulty in my country to use ceramic on ceramic. It's like a, ma uh, like a mantra, uh, crackling and fracture. And I have only seen two fractures 
So what do you consider is the reason why the community does not adopt uh, young patients for ceramic on ceramic and tend to go for new systems like dual mobility? The question is um, why um, or to be community or a hyper niche surgeon uh, don't use more ceramic on ceramic on the young patients and they uh, probably prefer any other a combination of, of a variant. Well, I think that there are some reasons, no? but honestly, I think that the main reason is because ceramic on ceramic is an European uh, invention. That means most of the literature is American literature. no? So ceramic on ceramic is something described in Europe. And, and I think that for American people and then for the rest of the world to accept a European invention is sometimes very hard, no? For example, we have the semantic technique, it's an European, hydroxapatite, double mobility has been very difficult to accept, and of course, the ceramic on ceramic. I think that the, the, the first results with the old ceramics, it was true, it was, there was many, many cases with fracture, but with the new devices, the delta, the delta ceramic, the rate of break, of breakage, it's very, very few. I knew that the, 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 the follow up is very, very long with the cross link and ceramic, uh, devices, no? But up to 15 or 20 years. But what will happen in patients younger than 30 or 35 or 40 years, no? I think that these patients that were, uh, of the, 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 the wear is minor with ceramics and ceramic. The, so that's the, my election. Another reason is the price. Of course, ceramic or ceramic is more expensive than ceramic or poly. Dr. Sacha has a... Um, totally the truth. I think the, the best uh, travelogy for young patients, especially if they are a uh, normal anatomy with degenerative changes, is a metal-metal resurfacing hip. Uh, I did for a long time. Uh, we're not allowed to do that because North American regulation to my country and say, we're not going to send you this anymore. Uh, but at my age, because I'm younger still, I I like to have done a resurfacing people. The patients are straightforward doing everything. They flex and stand and do sports. And a lot of sports and a lot of jobs who I'm not sure if I'm going to allow for a patient with the ceramic on ceramic. There, there's a question for the audience. And uh, is it regarding the same topic? Is uh, uh, what... Uh, the what type of sports do you allow to young patients and why? This is a question for all of you. Um, I don't think it's important what we think about this, but it's a very good report for the University of Virginia, I think. Uh, this was a long time ago, but it's uh, real. Uh, the amount of sports who you allow the patient with the ceramic on ceramic, and these are reduced to 70% of any kind of sport and in metal metal was around 80 or 90 percent uh, you don't feel confident to say to somebody uh, throw to somewhere or uh, uh, use a bike and no with the ceramic and ceramic is, i think you're a good question para Sasha. Uh, you talk about the risk of infection on a patient with hemophilia. You say it's high. Do you change the antibiotic prophylaxis regimen to an antibiotic treatment, or do you maintain the treatment at five or ten days? Regarding the risk of infection that is higher in the hemophilic patient, um, the question is, uh, regarding the prophylaxis with antibiotics, do you do you do a standard prophylaxis in those patients? Um, yes, indeed. We we normally use for a primary uh, a total hip or total knee just one single shot of a uh, antibiotic on the anesthesia induction uh, for this kind of patient as well as a rheumatoid, a bad rheumatoid. We use a, a 20, 40, 48 hours or so two days of antibiotic, no longer than that. There's a question from the audience, from the international audience. See, if you have a patient with a, uh, that has a, the four joints, the four, two hips and two knee compromise, what is the order of your surgery? 
The older? The, 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 the which which, the which one order. did you yeah. perform oh, first, sorry, sorry. second, the order? Um, we always do hips first because I'm a hip and a knee surgeon. Uh, I don't like to talk about hips, but I think the academy is in the knee. Uh, but I always we start with the hip uh, total and then do the knee. Um, if it's a bilateral hip or bilateral knee, it doesn't matter for us because it's, uh, we use posterior approach and we need to move the patient for hips. And it's very, very um, non-funny. Uh, but for me, like uh, showing the, one of the pictures, uh, we did a few times, uh, two teams doing exactly the same. Uh, but it's better to do one and following the, the second one. Okay. There's another question, Dr. Pablo. Uh, Dr. Pons, uh, one question. The squeaking is the more in the young people or the same to the to the old people? Well, I, I really I really don't ratio? know, no, and I don't know if in literature say something like that, no. But if you read literature, the rate of squeaking is very different uh, according to the paper you read. There are some reports about less than zero point five percent until reports about thirty five percent of the patients, no. So I think that many, many times the squeaking or the noises are more related uh, about the, the way that the doctor asks to the patient that really what the patient feels, no? I mean, if you have a patient and you ask many, many times, are you sure you, you don't hear any noise on your hip? Are you really sure? So I think maybe this patient will, uh, will listen to these noises, no? On the other side, it's true. There is some patient with a squeaking that you can listen even when the patient comes into your office, and it's true. I don't know. I can't tell you if it's more frequent in younger than in older. I am sorry. Any other question from the audience? No. Um, you want to do a closing remarks, Nico? Yes. Okay. So... Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Picas. I don't know if you are here. Thank you, Sofian, uh, to join for all the the word, uh, the secret word to, about Pioneer. Uh, this conjoint meeting, and thank you for joining us. I don't know if Picas have a final remark. No, he left already. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Sí, buenos días, eh, pero muchas gracias a ustedes por estar hoy acá a esta hora. 